So we've, we've all got that, you know. Being uh, prophetic is not some super, uh, some super status that only a select few people have. All of us have the ability to prophesy. Have we covered, you know, I'm just gonna, because I'm a teacher, I'm going to um, interact with you and ask you some questions. Have we covered the difference between uh, having prophetic gifting and the office of a prophet? Have we covered that at all? Okay, so really, really quickly, there is a difference. So an evangelist sees the world in terms of an evangelistic lens. So he sees the world in terms of souls. That's my husband. Everywhere we are, he's looking for souls. Where, who can I talk to? Sometimes it's annoying. We're in the airport, and he wants to stop and talk to everyone. I'm like, honey, we need to get to our gate now. <laughs> but he's an evangelist. That's how he sees the world. A creative person sees the world in terms of what can I create and the colors and how they combine. And, you know, a lady who's into interior decorating will walk into a house and go, that couch needs to go there. That curtain needs to change. Their colors need to be changed because that's clashing with the carpet. Does anybody know anyone like that? Yeah. Okay, anyone like that? Yeah. So that's, that's your lens. That's how you see the world. So uh, a prophetic person will see. So somebody who's in the office of a prophet, that's their whole world. That's how they see everything. Okay, so they actually, I would say it's not even a lens because like glasses you put on. It's just, it's, they're, it's already inside of them. It's the way they see the world through their eyes. Okay, so a gifting, so the prophet does not have to like turn the, the gift of prophecy on and off. It's just who they are. It's how they think, what, um, what they're flowing in all the time. Now, the gifting of prophecy is a little bit more like it, it comes and goes, okay? So, um, and that's okay. It's not that prophets are superior to people who flow in the gifting. There's a need for both, okay? And like Paul said, I desire that all of you prophesy, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's the difference. There is going to be an increase in prophecy in the last days, and I'm excited about that because I'm interested in the last days. I'm interested in what God is doing, and I'm also interested in, in the prophetic and how, that's, how God is using that. So an evangelism is an important part of that. When you go up to somebody, and like the Bible says, God lays their heart bare. Has anyone had that experience? Yep, you go up and talk to them, you give them a word of knowledge, and God lays their heart bare. They're astonished. They're amazed. How could God know that? I spoke to a teenage girl a couple of weeks ago in Australia, and she um, was not a believer. And God was showing me some, some things about her. And the words I was getting, I was like, oh, God, how do I word this? <laughs> and, you know, that's what you need to do. Sometimes you need to filter the stuff that you're being given as well because you might say it one way through your lens and your filter, but God wants you to filter it through his spirit. That's important to learn that's how good. to do. Mm. So I, the, the word that I was getting is, you like to date bad boys, don't you? <laughs> and I thought, oh God, help me with this one. How do I say this? And I said, uh, you are drawn to guys that you feel sorry for. And maybe they're considered the bad boy. But you keep finding yourself in relationships with them. And she kind of looked at me like, what? And, and we went from there. And I said to her at the end, I said, God has your number. He loves you. He knows everything about you. And I, you know, I could have preached to her until I was blue in the face. I could have shared the gospel. It wouldn't have made a dent. But she needed that. She needed to know that God loves her. And that's why I love prophetic. So I'm going to share with you really quickly a little bit of, of my prophetic journey, how God has, has been working in my life. So the reason I love the prophetic so much is, is the, the way that it started. When I was 15 years old, I went to a youth camp. And at this youth camp, I wasn't expecting a whole lot to happen. In fact, I wanted to go there and have fun. They had sand dunes and we went sandboarding. Down. Has anyone done that? You wax the, maybe it's just an Australian thing. You wax the bottom of your uh, boogie board or your surfboard and you go down the side of a sand dune. It's a lot of fun. 
Anyway, I wanted to go there and do that. You know, and maybe talk to boys, or I don't know. But, but what all teenage girls and boys want to do, they want to meet each other and talk and hang out with their friends. So, to my surprise, this guy came to speak at the meeting, young guy, he would have been in his 20s, and while we were worshiping, there was a, there was a strong atmosphere. I didn't recognize what that was because I hadn't been exposed to it too much. There was a strong atmosphere. And he pointed straight at me. He said, you, come here. You know what I did? <laughs> and I, I was instantly petrified. I, my first re response was, what have I done? <laughs> I, I felt like I was going to the principal's office. You know, and he called me right out the front. And I stood in front of him. And you, he said to me, ever since you were a little girl, you felt incredibly rejected. You've been through a lot of pain. You've found it hard to make friends at school. You've always felt different. And he, start, he starts telling me all this stuff that nobody could know. And he says, one day you're going to write books. And I thought, yeah, right. I hate writing essays at school. There is no way I'm going to write a book. But he said, you're going to write books and they're going to reveal the character and the person of God. And he said, and the, the, the thing that stuck with me the most is he said at the end, he said, while I was driving here in my car, God gave me that word for you. And I just looked at him like, well, how could you have a word for me? You've never met me before. He said, God showed me your face while I was driving in my car. And it still tears me up today because I wasn't looking for God. You know, I had been brought up a Christian, but at that point in my life, I was not looking for him, but he was looking for me. Mm -hmm. So the basis of prophecy is love. Does that mean that we, we have to always say Jesus loves you? And, you know, sometimes we have to deliver a tough word, but the basis is always love. It is never to tear people down. It is always to build them up. Yes. So that's what happened in the beginning. The, the next thing that I remember is when I was about 17, I remember at youth group, they asked some of us to come forward and pray for, for our friends. And they called me to do that. And I remember praying for one girl. And I thought, this feels different to my regular dead friends. When, when I prayed a lot of the time as a teenager, I just felt like my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. But when I prayed for this girl, I thought something feels different. And she was crying. She starts crying. And after I finished praying for her, she opens her eyes and she says, how did you know that? How did you know all that stuff? And I didn't know anything about prophecy. I said, I, I don't know. I, I guess God showed me. So that was the, the second thing that happened. But the thing that really, really cemented it for me, this, this was very recently. This was only about four years ago. I was in Australia. We were ministering at a church uh, in, in Perth, my home city. And I had been frustrated for a while. I'd been praying for people. And in all honesty, I'd be thinking, you know, my husband prays for people. They get healed. <laughs> they get touched, you know. And I pray for people. And it's like, you know, what, what's your prayer need? You know, what can I pray for you to? I, I just felt really inadequate, to be honest. You know, and when you marry someone that's been in ministry since they were at the age of 11, it can be a little intimidating. <laughs> so, but I, I just, I just felt like something was lacking. I needed some, some, something, but I didn't know what it was. And after we finished, finished the, the uh, preaching and the ministry time, this petite, blonde-haired lady, South African lady, comes bounding up to me. And she goes, hi, I'm Tracy. She sticks her hand out and she, she shakes my hand vigorously and she starts to give me a prophetic word on the spot. No, no more introduction, just she launches straight into it. Today she's my, one of my best friends. She's just an amazing lady and she's been a mentor to me. But she cut, cut straight to the chase and she said, God is calling you out of the cave. I was like, excuse me? She said, you've been stuck in the cave and God is telling you to get out. You've been keeping your, um, keeping the, the gifts that he has given you suppressed and you've not been using them. And I said, what do you mean? 
She said, you're going to move in the prophetic gifts. God is going to use you in a way that you can't imagine. So I was kind of, I'm still a bit taken aback. I was like, okay. Um, and she goes, you just need, you just need to be activated. You just need to, to have the opportunity to use those gifts. And she, and she said, you know what? Why don't you come to my house next week and I'll get together a group of my friends, you know, small group, four or five friends, and you can come and you can prophesy over them. <laughs> and I, I had all this theology and I, I said to her, I said, does it work like that? Is it like a light switch? Can we just turn it on and off? She goes, yeah, you, you, you're a prophetic person. It's just, it's there. It's in you. You're going to come to my house and you're going to prophesy over them. And it wasn't a suggestion. It was, this is what we're going to do. And I love that about Tracy. That's how she works. So, you know, and she was one of the first people that actually said, let's do this. You know, a lot of people talk about it, but she actually gave me the opportunity. If you're a mentor to somebody, I encourage you. Take action. You know, do something that activates them. So I went around to her house. I was petrified. I was absolutely terrified. I thought, I, I'm going to prophesy over these people. They are going to think I'm a false prophet. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm going to uh, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do. And we played some worship songs more because I asked Tracy to. You know, we can have these religious ideas about prophecy. You know, I thought, you know, how David played the harp. I thought, okay. Uh, okay, we need to play some worship songs and, and then the atmosphere comes down and then the Holy Spirit flows and then I can prophesy. Maybe. I hope. It's not always like that. You know, prophecy can be as natural as breathing. Some of the most powerful prophecies we have had have been when we've been sitting there having lunch with people and in between a mouthful of lettuce they start reading our mail. I'm serious. Okay, so it's uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but prophecy doesn't need to be spooky. Right. It doesn't. So we, I think we've gotten through one worship song, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm still not ready. Thank you, Jesus. I'm still not ready. And Tracy goes, okay. And she turns the music off. I'm like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do? She's taken my music away. I can't prophesy now. <laughs> Again, those, you know, religious ideas. So I started praying for these people. And as I did, the words just came. They just flowed. And I had that knowing. I just knew stuff about them that I, I couldn't possibly know other than by the Holy Spirit. And as I prayed for each person, I remember a couple of them began to cry. And I just, I relaxed. The fear fell away from me. And after we finished, Tracy looked at them. She said, okay, I want you to give a percentage. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> She says, give a percentage of how accurate she was. I thought, whoa, you didn't say anything about percentages here. You know, I prefer to just to, to go home right now and never see these people ever again and never hear any feedback. And I was amazed. And, and by the grace of God, each person said, that's exactly what's going on in my life. That's exactly what's, what's happening. I needed to hear that. That was so spot on. You know, and it's, it's not to say that I've always been that spot on. You know, we're human beings, okay? And sometimes we're not 100% accurate, but God gives us grace. You know, but I think sometimes when you're a beginner, God just gives you that boost, right? He gives you that boost. So that's what he did with me that day. So I just want to share with you some basic principles I know that you have the basics, so I'm not going to um, not going to linger for too long on it. But as I just described in that story, a measure of risk is always involved. Always, number one, a measure of risk is always involved. There is never a time that I prophesy over someone and I don't feel like I'm. Jump, not jumping off a cliff. I don't feel like I'm jumping off a cliff. Every time I feel like I'm jumping off a cliff. Every single time. And I thank God for that and I'll tell you why. Because it means that I need to depend on Him every single time. If you ever get to a place, now I'm not saying 
It's, I'm not saying if it, it's wrong to confidently exercise your gifts. We can't be insecure. You have to be secure to step out and do these things. But you, um, if you ever feel like, I've got this, then there could be a problem. You know what I'm saying? If you're ever thinking, I've got this, I know how to do this, then you, you need to get on your knees. You really do, because we must depend on God to yes. prophesy. The only way to learn is to take risks. I have made mistakes. Okay, I have made mistakes. The prophetic friends that we know have made mistakes as well. Now, if you make a mistake, it doesn't make you a false prophet. Everyone say, phew. It doesn't make you a false prophet. It makes you human being, okay? And sometimes the flesh can get in there. And sometimes, um, you know, things can filter what we're saying the wrong way. But you know what? You just need to repent and move on. Because what will happen is if you don't, the enemy will bring condemnation. And he will say, you messed up so badly. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever prophesy again. And then what happens is the gift is shut down. The enemy loves to shut down the prophetic giftings. Loves to. Why? Because it enables God's people to hear his voice in a, in a dynamic way on earth. The enemy would love to silence the voice of God on earth. And he would love to destroy that more personal, intimate relationship that prof the gift of prophecy is capable of bringing. Number two, everybody hears differently. Everyone hears differently. That's okay. You know, we uh, went to a marriage conference a few weeks ago, and it was wonderful. It was really good in Orlando. And um, they were teaching us that a lot of the things that you think your spouse is doing wrong are just different. <laughs> yeah? Anyone know what I'm talking about? It's not wrong. It's just different. Okay, so you might hear the audible voice of God. My husband has heard the audible voice of God sometimes. I joke sometimes that that's the only way to get his attention. <laughs> but that is an awesome privilege that God has given him, that he has heard the audible voice of God. For me, I've never heard the audible voice of God. It's probably a good thing because I've probably run out of the room screaming. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to handle that, you know, but God speaks to me in a, in a still, soft voice. I can't say I've ever had a vision. You know, some people think that prophetic people should all see visions. I don't see visions, but I, I operate more with impressions um, and what I call a heart voice. So you hear God speaking to you in your heart. It's almost like reading words off a screen, but it's there in your heart. So if there's audible voice, heart voice, um, impressions. For example, when Paul was um, on the ship to, forget where he was going, but there was a lot of bad weather. Anyways, the weather died down and the guys said, it's okay, nothing's gonna happen, we're good now. But it says that Paul, uh, Paul said to them, men, I perceive that this voyage will only end in disaster. I perceive. Now he didn't say, I was in my cabin, I heard the voice of God and he said, guys, this is not gonna go well, okay? He perceived it and that's what an impression is like. You perceive something in your spirit. Some of you might receive dreams. Okay, dreams are another wonderful way of hearing from God. The thing I like about dreams is that you have no say. <laughs> And I think that's why God speaks to me in dreams sometimes because he wants me to have all my thought process, all my analyzing, all of that turned off. And then he's like, okay, now I can talk to you. So I mentioned visions. Visions were very common with the prophets in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Jeremiah saw visions, Daniel saw visions. Sometimes people receive mental pictures, and I, 
I've noticed this tends to be people that are more um, like you know how there's different learners, kinesthetic learners, visual learners, uh, people that tend to be more visual, people who um, think in terms of pictures, God is more likely to give them a picture when they're prophesying to somebody. Also, sometimes, and I've had this happen um, a handful of times, you'll be praying for somebody and you will perceive the emotion that they are feeling. So there are some times when I pray for people and I have just started crying and crying because I will feel the, the pain that that person is feeling and the things that they're, they're going through. So for example, I prayed for a mother one time and her, her daughter was about to go and be a missionary. And as I was praying for her, you know, I was praying that God would bless the daughter and guide her footsteps and everything. And then I, I started praying for the mom and I just started weeping and weeping. And I said to her, you know, the Lord says he sees your sacrifices. He sees how hard it is for you in your, your mother's heart to let her go. You know, so that in that instance, I perceived the, the, the emotions. I was picking up on them. Number three, some people say it's wrong to do this, but from my experience, it's been a great tool. It's okay to ask questions. Now, this is my personal opinion. You're not going to find this in the Bible, but I believe it's okay to ask questions. Okay? So, for example, if you're starting out, it can be a great thing uh, to build your confidence to ask people questions to confirm what you're saying. So, for example, um, I feel led to pray about your daughter. Is something going on in her life at the moment? And then the person might say, yes, yep, there's stuff going on. Then you're encouraged to continue. Now, I'm, there's a difference. I'm not saying questioning. Some people use questions like a questionnaire. They use it like a quiz. And they use it to dig around to find, try and find stuff and get information to prophesy about. That's not what this is about. Okay, so the questions are led by the Spirit. They're not led by our mind. It's not, there's not a formula. You are not less spiritual if you ask questions. Okay, I used to think that I had to go in and say, thus says the Lord, you know, and I, I had to get it right, I had to be bang on target. But sometimes God will reveal things to you gradually, and those questions will, will help, um, help you know that you're on the right track. So I'll give you an example. I was praying for a lady one time, and I said, I'm sensing that um, something's going on with your, your job. Now, be very careful that your brain doesn't get in the way. Okay, so I'm hearing something about a job. So my brain goes, she must be unemployed. So I said to her, do you have employment right now? She said, yes. I said, oh. And in the early days, I would have backed off. I would have thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm so not good at this. I'm just going to stop right now. This is terrible. This is a disaster. I just quickly move on to the, the next person. Okay. But I, I had enough experience at that point to know that I could press in and I could um, ask some more questions. So I said to her, the Holy Spirit, uh, I felt uh, impressed by the Holy Spirit to ask her, do you enjoy your job? She said, no, I hate my job. And I said to her, I said, have you ever thought of starting a business? Like, do you have some kind of heart's desire to start your own business? She says, yes, I love jewelry. I've always wanted to start my own jewelry business. You know, but I just don't see how that can be possible. Actually, I think it was cosmetics. I wanted to start my own cosmetics business. And inside I'm going, yay, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, so there had been some questions involved. But we had gotten to the root of, you know, what God, God, and, it, you know, it's interesting because I think that's why God didn't say to me directly, she wants to start a cosmetic business. Sometimes, God, there's, like I said, there's no formula. Sometimes God will lead you that way. So, okay, number five. 
please don't neglect the basics. Okay, so what are some of the basics? Let's call them out. In our Christian walk, what are some of the basics? Yeah, reading the word, absolutely. Absolutely, I've met some really interesting prophetic people who don't read the word, and their prophetic words are interesting as well. <laughs> you have to stay in the word. You have to stay rooted in the word. What's some other ones? Prayer. You've got to pray. How are you going to speak the word of God if you're not listening to his voice? You need to be anchored in these things. You need to be an anchored in, in the word, in prayer. Fasting. Yes. Fasting. The flesh gets in the way. It is a good prophetic practice to per periodically get away and fast. Okay? It puts the flesh under and it makes it easier to hear what God is saying. Another uh, basic is be under a covering, please. Please. Okay, we have seen prophetic people that go from church to church and all they do is they criticize and they move on. They go to the next church, they criticize and they think they're prophesying. But really what's going on is they have a critical spirit. They are not under a co covering. Okay, so you need to, you need to be in a covering. And it might not even be, I'm not even talking about like a, um, like a church covering, although that is great. I, it could be a prophetic, um, a prophetic group of people, like how Elijah had the, um, what do you call it? He had the team of prophets around him. Um, yeah, not the school of pro prophets. Yeah, oh, thank you. Elijah had the school of prophets around him. So he was surrounded by like-minded people. Be, be connected to a group. Because you know what happens if you don't? Remember Elijah out in the desert? He lost connection. He wasn't out there with his buddies. He was out there by himself. And if you, if you are a prophetic person, um, emotions tend to run high. Especially if you are, not just if you're in the giftings, if you are a prophet. So I'm speaking to people who are in the office of a prophet now. We tend to be quite emotional, okay? So it's really important to stay connected so you can stay balanced. What happened to Elijah? He got out of the desert. He said, I want to die. I've had enough. I'm the only one left. You know, he was having a pity party. So stay connected. Also, don't only, and I've been guilty of this, okay? Don't only seek God when you're going to minister or when you're going to prophesy. Remember Simon the sorcerer? He said, I want that power. Let's not be guilty of falling into the same trap. Seek God at all times, not just when we want that gifting. So I'm going to race through the next couple of ones, and then we're going to move on to prophetic pitfalls. So I'm going to be talking about the basics, and then I'm going to be talking about some of the pitfalls to avoid. So I already covered this one a little bit. Prophecy doesn't have to be spooky. Okay, you don't have to ask everyone in the word in the room to go, shh, quiet, I'm listening to God's voice. <laughs> Make people uncomfortable. You can prophesy to someone on the street. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, that's that's scary. That's scary to prophesy to an unbeliever because they have no foundation at all for what is happening. But but like I said, I believe that God is going to use prophecy in that way in the end times. He's going to use it hugely. When my mother was 17 years old, she went out with a, uh, a group of other teenagers, and they were praying for people and prophesying in the streets. And God gave my mother a word of knowledge, and she went up to a homeless man and told him what his name was. You can imagine the impact that that had on him, to know God knows me by name. If we're just all going to sit around and be comfortable and pat each other on the back and give each other prophetic words, what's the point? Right. What's the point? You know, we prophecy is for outside of the church as well. We have to take it outside of the four walls. Think, think of it in church as practice, right? It's practice for out there. Number seven, expect 
persecution, but don't get a victim mentality. Okay? Expect persecution, but don't get a victim mentality. We have seen a lot of prophetic people out there who truly are gifted by the Lord, and they truly do operate in prophecy, but they have been wounded again and again and again. And it has really caused them to get off track. They've developed a victim mentality. Uh, they drift from church to church. They don't have roots. They often have a critical spirit, and they're weighed down by bitterness. Expect to get persecuted, but keep your heart clean. One of the things that God told me a few years ago is that to survive in ministry, I would need to have a soft heart and a tough heart. I'll say that again. You need a soft heart and a tough hide to survive in ministry. And sometimes we get it the wrong way around. We start to develop a tough heart and a soft heart. Okay, so anything that comes our way, we just it, it immediately it penetrates our heart. That's not what God wants. He wants it the other way around. Okay, so let's look at some of the pitfalls. How am I going for time? Have you got a clock you can put up there? Okay, no worries. Okay. Well, since I don't know the time, I can just talk as long as I want. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so some of the pitfalls. We'll get through these quickly. Number one, believing that to prophesy is a sign of spiritual maturity or superiority. Okay? You are not the bee's knees just because you can prophesy. Okay, although Paul says that the one who prophesies is superior to the one who's speaking in tongues, I believe what he's really saying is that that gift is superior in the sense that you can understand what's being said, that it edifies. But he's not saying if you are a prophet, you are superior to everybody else. Does that make sense? Okay, so some people get the gift of prophecy and it goes straight to their head. They think, I've made it. I've arrived. I can prophesy. But We've met some incredibly immature people who prophesy. God, don't put him in a box. Don't put God in a box. He will use anyone that he pleases. I've had incredibly accurate prophecies in my life. You know, and I, I've looked at the package and I thought, mm, not so keen on the package. But God chooses to operate how he wills through who he wills. And by the way, I love your sign here that says no perfect people allowed. Because you should rejoice that God uses you as imperfect as you are. So maybe I might look put together this morning and, and composed. But on the way here on the drive from Orlando, it was not the case. We spilled coffee. The phone froze. We lost the, G, the, the GPS lost signal. The kids were screaming. The baby spit up on herself. <laughs> okay, so whether you prophesy, whatever, you're, you're a human being. And like I said, we always need to keep that humility. We need to keep that dependence on God. Second pitfall, believing that God speaks all the time. Now this is an interesting one because obviously with prophecy, we're talking about God speaking. But there are some times when God does not speak. And in the prophetic, we need to recognize when God is not speaking. Because if we do not, we risk prophesying in our own flesh. And God is sitting there going, I didn't say anything. I didn't actually say anything. So the, the way that God trained me in this is when I first started prophesying over people, sometimes he would stay silent when I would go to pray for, for certain people. And I think it was more for me than them. You know, I, I think that Alejandro came along behind me and he probably did prophesy for those people. Um, but sometimes I would stand there and I'd pray for people and it would be like, I've, I've got nothing, nothing. I'm not hearing anything from God. So God, it doesn't happen so much now 
But in the early days, that's what he did. And he said to me, will you humble yourself enough to admit when I am not speaking, no matter how it might look to people? Mm. And I remember, you know, sometimes I would pray for people and I would move on and you could almost see the look on their face like, where's my word? Where's my word? I didn't get my word. And that that's, I didn't include that in the pitfalls, but that's another one. Don't let anybody pull a prophetic word out of you. Just people can put pressure on you as well when they, as soon as they know that you operate in the prophetic. So, if you are not sure of yourself, you will fall into the trap of prophesying when God is not speaking. I'll give you another example. Um, we were at a meeting one time when we were dating. It was a prophetic meeting. And somebody found out that Alejandro was a minister and he came up to him enthusiastically and he said, he, he gave him the microphone, he said, brother, you have a word. You have a word. Do you know what Alejandro said? No, I don't. <laughs> and at that moment I was like, I know I'm going to marry this man. <laughs> because it showed me that he was so... He, there was no insecurity in his calling, in who he is. He, if he had insecurity, he would have thought to himself, oh, oh, I've got to come up with a word. I've got to come up with a word. What am I going to do? Uh, 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 the Lord says you're blessed. Um, you're going to get a new car. You're, a amen. And he, he would, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean. He would have we all have the ability to come up with something, okay? Even if it's just, bless you, amen. But he didn't. He just said, no, I don't. I don't have a word. So if God is not giving you a word, do you have security as well to admit that at that moment in time, he's not saying anything to you? And by the way, just because you're a prophet or Prophetic does not mean that God is going to reveal everything to you either. Sometimes we can fall into that into that trap. Look at Elisha when he's on the mountain and the Shunammite woman comes up the hill riding her donkey. Her son has just died. And Gehazi says to Elisha, what's going on? What's wrong with her? What does Elisha say? She is in deep distress, but the Lord has not revealed to me what it is. God could have told him, but God had a different plan. When the Shunammite woman came and fell down at his feet, she spoke what was in her heart. She said, you've deceived me. God wanted to hear that from her mouth, not because God didn't know that was in her heart, but because God wanted her to know that was in her heart. And he wanted her to deal with it. She had faith issues. God wanted... God, God wanted to um, her to acknowledge the doubt she was struggling with first. Again, God moves in all different ways. But at that point in time, God chose not to tell Elisha what was going on. He had reasons. Okay, number, number three, fear and pride. Fear and pride. Fear is really just insecurity in different clothes. That's really what it is. So I mentioned we need to fear God enough to not let our own securities. You know what insecurity is, really? It's self-love. That's what it is. You know, we can dress it up and say, I'm such a delicate flower and I'm so insecure. And, but really what we're saying is I love myself so much. I really hope that everybody else does too. <laughs> is that okay? Can I say that? Yeah, insecurity is being focused on ourselves. If you are insecure, it will really affect your ability to move in the prophetic. Number four, being led by emotions and having the wrong delivery. These go hand in hand. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I was prophesying over a young woman and she was telling me, but I, I prefer for people not to tell me their story because I prefer to hear it from God. And I don't want the word that I'm giving them to be colored in any way by what they're saying. But sometimes it happens. Sometimes people just blurt out to you what they're, they're going through. And she did this. And she was telling me 
how she had been abused and all these terrible things had happened to her and how the, these people had taken advantage of her. And as I'm listening to her, my, in my heart, in my, my soul realm, my emotions, I'm thinking, this poor girl, this is awful what has happened to her. And I think there was some, um, I think there was a physical need for healing as well. And so I'm praying for healing, you know, and I, in, in my flesh, I wanted to, to say to her, you know, it's going to be all right, sweetie, and God's heard you, and he understands how people have hurt you, and, and the Holy Spirit said, stop. Ask her to forgive the people that have hurt her. So I told her, and something really interesting happened. Her face, her, so her posture up until this point had been like this. When I said to her, you need to forgive, she went like this. And she was up in my face. She was mad. She was mad when I said that. Her whole demeanor snapped. And I thought, woo, okay, we uncovered something there. Some, God put his finger on something that she needed to deal with, and she didn't like it. So I prayed for it. She refused to forgive. And at, at, at the end, I think the Holy Spirit said, you need to leave her and you need to pray for the next person. And I said, but I want her to walk out of here free. And the Holy Spirit said to me, she is bound by a spirit of self-pity. You can pray for her until the cows come home and she's not ready. She's not going to be free. So... That, that's an example of how my emotions were saying one thing, but the Holy Spirit was saying something different. Number five, getting away from the Word. I'm only going to touch on this briefly. Please, please, if you ever hear somebody saying, prophesying, that somebody needs to leave their husband or their wife, because God wants them to marry someone different, someone more godly, you need to shut that thing down right away. That is not the word of God. Anything you hear that is not the, does not line up with the word of God, that doesn't mean that the supernatural is not out there. It is often out there. But it will have that basis of the word. It will have that basis of scripture. Number six, listening to too many opinions and sharing too much information. This actually applies more for uh, receiving a personal word of direction for yourself. But I thought it was important to include this. Don't listen to too many opinions. You can call 50 friends and you can get 50 different prophetic words. Right? <laughs> Go to God. Go to God. Find out what he is saying to you. And then if you do talk to people, let it be few people. And see if what they're saying confirms to you what you're already sensing in your spirit. Okay, so somebody said to us once, a, a pastor said to us that prophecy should not be, when we're looking for guidance, it should not be directional, it should be confirmational. Okay, so if somebody says to you, I really feel like you're supposed to leave your job and you're supposed to quit tomorrow and you're supposed to go into full-time ministry, if you're not feeling it, don't do it. And you have, you have the option of waiting until you do feel it. And if you, you really do feel like that's what, it, God's, that's what God's wanting you to do, you can step out and do that. But often, when there is a word like that and it's accurate, you would have already been sensing that. Amen? Okay, so the last one, number seven, this is so important. If you forget, if you don't remember anything else that I've said today, please just remember this one thing. The, the seventh pitfall in the prophetic is losing connection to the secret place. Don't lose connection to the secret place. Everything flows out of that. Amen? Everything. What did Elijah do when he ran out into the desert?